Welcome to our second talk on wildflower identification. Today we're going to focus on wetland wildflowers. And this is part of the Helping Hands for Butterflies project, which is a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Nature Scott. And today we'll be looking at wetlands and riverbanks and other freshwater habitats. And um, we won't be covering peat bogs and sea coasts because they'll be in a whole other lesson because the plants in those are quite different to some of those we'll be looking at today. In Scotland, we really do get so much rain that most of our meadows could be classified as damp or wet in some way. And so most of our lowland grasslands probably do have many of these plants in them. In Scotland, we have 31,000 freshwater locks and lochens and over 125,000 kilometres of rivers and streams. And if you just zoom in the map, you can see for a start, it's crisscrossed by major rivers. As you go down further and further, you'll see that everywhere is crisscrossed with rivers and fresh water. And that means that a lot of our um, plant communities are sustained by these water bodies and they for, therefore they sustain populations of butterflies and moths too. Now, one of the plant families I didn't cover last time was the umbellifers, sometimes also known as the carrot family. So I'll talk about this one today because many of these plants are found around these habitats. It can be a very difficult family. It's a very large family of plants with many of the plants looking very similar with only subtle differences in the shapes of leaves or even the seeds used to separate them. But what you're looking for with this plant is the fact that the flowers are all held in umbels at the end of stalks, just like an umbrella, like the spikes in an umbrella. So if you look at the diagram here, you'll see that the flowers are all held at the very end with these stalks coming out at the very top. However, many of them are poisonous, such as hemlock, and they can also be irritants to skin, such as wild carrot and hogweed. So what I find is best just to learn a few easy ones. So we'll talk about a few of the easy ones today. One of the most recognisable and commonest is cow parsley. Um, so it's found in almost all road verges and riverbanks. So if you go um, down one of these roads in early spring, usually around May or June, you'll see, uh, you'll see cow parsley in bloom. Now, it is quite easy to confuse with a poisonous species called hemlock. But some features to look out for include fine hairs on the leaves and stems. The stems themselves are grooved, often with purple stripes, but never purple blotches. If it has purple blotches, it's very likely to be hemlock. And as I mentioned, it is one of the earliest plants to bloom. So it comes out in May, whereas many of the other species in this group come out later in the year. So it, it's an easy one to know just because it's so common and uh, yet very widespread. Then Sweet Sicily um, is another one which is quite easy to identify just because of its smell. Um, but first of all, you'll find it in habitats like wet ditches and in riverbanks. And if you're walking along, especially on a warm summer day, you can smell aniseed in the air. And that's a very good indication that Sweet Sicily is nearby. So if you have a closer look at some of the plants, you'll notice that they have, um, well, for a start, they grow quite tall, almost two meters in height. And they have these fern-like leaves. So if you just look at the picture here, you'll see it's almost very soft, like a fern. And the flowers are all contained at the end of the stalks like this. But they're also quite distinctive because of their seed pods. They have these really hard, upright seed pods. First of all, they're green, as you can see in the bottom photo here. But as they get older, they turn dark and quite hard like this. Another similar plant, though, is called wild angelica. Now, you find wild angelica in similar habitats to the ones we've looked at already. You'll find it in wet meadows, fens and riverbanks and lake margins. And this flowers later in the year, so July and August. So roughly it's around the same time as sweet sicily, but not during the same time as cow parsley. It's another robust plant that grows up to two metres tall. And for me, one of the distinctive things about it is that it has purple tinged um, stems and flowers. If you look at the stem here, you can see it's not quite green. It's, it's got purple mixed throughout it. There's no hairs on the plant, which helps you to separate it from hogweed, which is hairy. But also, if you look at the umbels, they're quite rounded here. So this, the one in the center hasn't opened yet, but you can see they're all quite rounded. But whenever the flowers do open, you can see, see it still retains that rounded appearance. Another distinctive thing about this plant is, is that it has a, a large sheath around the upper stem as you can see in this photograph here. So it's got a leaf, a little smaller leaf at the end of it, but it's almost just like the, the flower has come out of this, this sheath here, and that's retained on the plant. And whenever I'm not sure about a wild angelica, I just look for that, and that is a good indication that the plant is wild angelica. The lower leaves are divided and they're not fern-like at all. And as you can see from the diagram, it has the sheath around the stem, 
which helps you to separate it from similar species. Now, there are some other plants which look like umbellifers, but aren't. And it's easiest just to learn these and uh, because they're in very small families, some of them. For example, wild valerian is in a very small plant family. And it, you would think that it might be within the carrot family because it has white flowers at the end of stalks. So uh, the easiest way is just to know wild valerian when you see it. Again, it's found in similar habitats with ditches, verges, and riverbanks. It's quite a widespread plant, growing quite tall as well, like many of those other plants we've seen already. But if you look at the flowers, they're kind of tinged with pink. So you can see it quite well in the diagram and in the photograph here, you can see they're just tinged with pink. And if I was able to zoom in closer, you would see that they're quite tubular. But I find that the, um, the leaves themselves are also quite distinctive. For a start, they're divided like this, so they're not fern-like, but also the ones going up the stem are quite um, thin and straggly, as you can see in the, in the top photograph with the straggly leaves, just like that. It's an excellent plant for the garden, actually, um, and it's really good for nectar sources for butterflies and moths. So uh, it, it is very similar to other plants which I've mentioned so far, and I reckon it is just easier to learn and remember, remember Valeria. The meadowsweet actually belongs in the rose family of plants, uh, but you find it in many similar habitats to the carrot family. So again, in damp places, ditches, verges, and riverbanks, and it grows quite tall to about 120 centimeters. You can get it growing in really dense clumps. So if you look in the bottom photograph here, you can see that whole area is actually covered in meadowsweet. And it's quite easy to identify because it has creamy white flowers and a really sweet scent. I roll to a different family of plants. This is one we met before. It's within the brassicas and this is cuckoo flower. It's also known as lady smock and you might see it labeled as that in books. But it gets its name because it flowers around the same time as the arrival of cuckoos in spring. So usually around May and into June. And we can tell instantly that it's a brassica because it has four petals. If you look on the diagram here, you'll see the four pale pink or lilac colored petals of the flowers. But I've also used this diagram because it's got the leaves on it. Now the upper leaves are, are long and thin, but the lower leaves are quite um, kind of kidney shaped like this. Now you find it in damp grassland, including road verges. And sometimes you can see it in huge masses just like this. So you can see the individual flowers here, but if you look beyond that, you can see this, this mass of lilac colored flowers going along. And it's a very easy one to spot when it's in bloom in spring, just because it really can um, be like nothing else on a landscape at that time. Um, and you can see here, it's on a, a path verge. And again, you can see that the, the, the stems themselves look tall here, but they only go to about maybe 30 centimeters tall, but they're, they're long and thin with all the flowers at the top. Now, another thing to look for is the fact that many white butterflies will lay their eggs upon it and they'll also nectar upon it. So this is a male orange tip. You can tell because he has the orange tip to the wing, whereas the females don't. But males of that species and females and other butterflies will take nectar from this plant, but they'll also lay their eggs upon it. And on the left hand side, you can see a green faint white egg and eggs of that species do tend to look white in appearance. You'll see them either on the stalk or sometimes on the leaves, whereas the orange tip butterfly tends to lay its eggs on the actual seed, um, the kind of seed pod itself where this would develop, and they're orange in colour. So you can look for both of those in spring and they're very easy to find. Now we're on to the mints, and the mints are important nectar plants for butterflies in Scotland. There are at least four species of mint found in Scotland, but um, there are many hybrids as well, so it can be confusing sometimes. So we'll show you some of the easy ones. Now, water mint, um, as its name suggests, does flower mostly along water edges. Um, but if you look at the flowers themselves, they're found in a round mass at the head of the plant with one or two whorls on the stems. Whorls are just where you've got like uh, flowers all around all sides of a stem. Um, so if you look at, it's almost like a pom-pom shape at the very top of the plant with these pale lilac colored flowers. And of course you can tell that it's mint because of the smell of the leaves. So if you're not sure, just rub the leaves and it should smell like mint does. Now with uh, some mints, you need to look at the hairs on the leaves to separate them. And you can see for this species, the leaves are not hairy, but the stems are. Then we have the spearmint and all flowers in this one are contained in terminal spikes. So you can see it's spikes at the end of a stem and they're quite long and thin and the flowers are going the whole way up 
but there's no pom-pom shape at the top as with water mint. And the leaves themselves are have coarse teeth which point forwards and the whole plant is relatively hairless. And then world mint, um, the flowers for this species, um, unlike the water mint, are found in whorls along the stem, not in a pom-pom shape at the top. But also uh, for this species, um, you've got sparse hairs on the leaves and on the stems. So it's quite a hairy plant and you can just about see those in the photograph there. Um, and while they are very good nectar plants for many species, they're also the caterpillar food plant for the mint moth. Now this is quite a small moth, but it's very brightly colored with this deep magenta color to the wings with bright speckles on it. Now this species is mostly found in Southern Scotland, but it could be spreading. So it's definitely one to keep an eye out for. And you do also find it on garden mints and oregano too. Now Devil's Biscavius is another one, which is a really good nectar plant, but also a caterpillar food plant. And it's a really attractive plant for adult butterflies and moths and bees and other insects coming to it for nectar. So if you see this blooming anywhere, you'll find lots of insects visiting it for food. You find it growing in damp grassland and in riverbanks, and it doesn't grow very tall, maybe again to about 30 centimetres with, um, with tall stalks like this, with these purpley blue flowers at the very end. Um, and according to a legend, it gets its name from the short stubby roots that looks like they've been bitten off by something underground. But it's a really important caterpillar food plant, um, especially for the narrow bordered bee hawk moth. Um, and this is a fantastic moth because it's the size of a queen bumblebee and it comes out around the same time as those queen bees, usually in around May or early June. And it's a really great mimic of bees because, uh, and this will prevent it from being eaten by predators. And you can see it's quite hairy, just like a bumblebee is. It's got stripes um, and different color patterns upon it. But also if you look at the wings, you can see that they're translucent. You can actually see through them. But whenever this moth first emerges, these there are scales here, so you can't see through it. But those scales are lost and that will um, help the illusion of it being a bumblebee. So it's, it's a really fantastic mimic of other insects. The caterpillars feed upon the devil's bit scabious for this species and the adults usually emerge in springtime and you'll see them nectaring upon plants like uh, red campion or ragged robin. So definitely one to keep an eye on. It's also the caterpillar food plant for the marsh fritillary. Um, and it's uh, if you have a look at the marsh fritillary, this is a European priority species. It's a butterfly which has declined so greatly across Europe that it's some of its main strongholds now are in Great Britain and in Ireland. So the marsh artillery, um, if you look at the map, you'll see that in Scotland, it's mostly found in the west of the country and in the islands. And it's mostly found in short, wet grasslands where the caterpillars compete upon devil's bit scabious. It's another interesting butterfly as well because it really needs extensive grassland networks and it can't just exist in small patches. And this is because it's prey to a parasitic wasp, which can lay its eggs inside the caterpillars and can wipe out entire populations in, in very small areas. So it needs to be able to recolonize from different patches of habitat nearby, which is why we really need to work on a landscape scale to conserve this species. Um, it's declined by about 50% since the 1970s, but there were huge losses even before then. So this butterfly really is just clinging on now to these important places. And we do do a lot of work with it and farmers in the west coast of Scotland and in different places around the UK to conserve the marsh artillery. And just a quick look at his life cycle. They lay their eggs around midsummer, uh, just like this, really large clumps of eggs on the devil's pit scabious. And in the caterpillars themselves, we can look for populations of this species because they make webs. And the caterpillars remain inside these webs for a while, taking over whole plants, and they do this for protection. But you might say the caterpillars coming out in springtime, so they remain in these webs through the winter. They come out in spring and they'll begin to bask upon plants and take in the warmth. Then they make their chrysalises, which are really brightly coloured, and those will re-emerge as adults in summertime. Now back to the plants, and we're onto the plants with marsh in their name. Um, so we'll start off with the marsh marigold. This should be flowering um, very early in spring, before the leaves are even on the trees. Um, and it's also known as king cup, because it has cup-shaped, really golden flowers, just like this. It's almost like a big buttercup, um, and you can see it quite easily wherever it flowers, because there's very little else in bloom at that time. 
You find it in damp places like meadows, marshes and ditches, but also on the edges of fresh water, such as rivers or against uh, locks and lochens. Then we're on to the marsh woundwort and we met hedge woundwort in our previous talk. Now the marsh woundwort, as its name suggests, is found in damper places. The leaves themselves come directly from the main stalk, so there isn't any stalk with a leaf at the end. The leaves come right from the central stalk and it has pale pink flowers, whereas the hedge woundwort has darker purple flowers. They can flower up to one meter tall and they bloom from midsummer onwards. So they're really good, important nectar plants for butterflies and other insects. And the name woundwort comes from its long association with um, the healing of wounds and aching joints. The marsh sinkfoil, um, it's really not a very showy plant. It's one that you'll be lucky to see if you're walking through quite a damp place, um, especially marshes. Um, so, but if you see the flowers, then they are deep magenta colored and all, actually all parts of the flower are this color. So you can see the, the inner flower and the outer flower are deep purple, but also the inside bits, these stamens and stigmas are purple too. So it's a really, really nice plant to see. And it's an, it's an excellent plant for pollinating insects in these habitats. And they flower from May until July. And they're actually really closely related to strawberries. So in garden centers, you can buy hybrids between marsh sink foil and strawberries, and you can actually get some which produce fruits as well. Now the marsh violet, um, it's a violet found mostly in wet meadows and um, it flowers from April until July. So around the same time as dog violet blooms. But unlike dog violet, the flowers tend to be a pale lilac in color, but sometimes you can get them slightly darker, but they usually have these fine streaks, especially on the lower petals, as you can see just here. So pale, or pale overall, but with dark streaks on the inner petal. It's quite low growing, so again, it's one that you have to be walking through a wet place in order to see it growing and to keep your eye out for it. But the leaves are kidney shaped and always rounded, unlike the dog violet where the leaves are heart shaped. So if we just have a closer look at the leaves, you can see they have this kind of kidney shape and overall they're quite rounded with no distinct tip to them. The marsh violet, like the dog violet, is an important caterpillar food plant for many of our fertility species. Um, including the pearl bordered, small pearl bordered and dark green fritillaries. So um, these are all species which can be found in dry habitats on sunny hillsides, but you can also find them in damper habitats where the marsh violet is growing. Now the water avens is a plant uh, which is found mostly along riverbanks and in wet meadows, and you can see it growing in really large clumps like this. These are all the leaves which can form um, huge masses which block out everything else but the plant itself doesn't grow very tall. The really beautiful flowers when you look at them though the flowers are always dripping over so they face the ground on these red stems and they have um, outer, outer petals which are known as sepals as you can see here they're red in color but with really beautiful pale orange petals on the inside and yes they always drip towards the ground and um, they have deep red stems covered in hairs like this and the seeds, lucari. So the water avens would be a plant more for bumblebees and other insects which can visit it and less so for butterflies. A ragged robin is a really good indicator of wet habitats and you can see these really bright sprays of pink flowers from a great distance. They got these long frilly blooms and nothing else looks like ragged robin so it's very difficult to confuse with any other plants. It's uh, found in mostly damp meadows in full sunlight um, and it's a great plant for insect nectar, um, especially if you're looking for uh, moths such as the narrow bordered bee hawk moth, you might see them nectaring upon plants like this. But also I find lots of white butterflies like uh, um, orange tips and small whites nectaring upon these plants as well. The purple loosestrife, um, this is the first of our tall purple plants. Um, with purple loosestrife, they grow to about 120 centimeters tall. You find them in damp places as well. So if you look at the petals, so you'll see that they've got six long petals, which look quite messy. So they look quite raggedy overall. But what you're looking for with purple loose stripe are, are these long, uh, long stems covered in purple flowers the whole way down. <clears throat> From a distance, though, you might confuse it with similar tall purple plants like great willow herb and rose bay willow herb. And you mostly find it at the margins of lakes, rivers, and ponds.
So those two willow herbs, which I've mentioned already, um, we'll start with the one which is found in drier places. This is probably more common and more familiar to people. It's called Rose Bay Willow Herb, um, sometimes also known as fireweed, because it's an excellent colonizer of disturbed places where there might have been a fire or other disturbance like that. So it's quite a vigorous plant, much more likely to be found in dry places, but you'll see it flowering from July until September. And the flowers look like, as you can see in the two photographs here, you'll see that they're quite, uh, quite broad masses of flowers all at the end of a stem. And the stems themselves are quite vigorous um, and dark red in appearance with these hairless uh, leaves, which all point upwards and spray out from the stems. The great willow herb is, it's in the same family of plants, but it is quite different. Now it does grow to roughly the same height, so it's quite a tall plant, but it's found in wetter places. So along riverbanks, uh, lake shores and places like that. Um, and it's got overall softly uh, hairy leaves and stems, but much fewer flowers as well. So it's not these dense masses like what the rose bay has. It's overall just a few flowers um, in, in smaller groups. Now the willow herbs, um, even though, um, especially rose bay willow herb is often treated as a weed um, and you know, it's, it's not always liked in so many places because it can take over, but it is a really good caterpillar food plant for the elephant hawk moth. Um, it's one of our most beautiful and striking moths. And you can see here, it's got these really large eyes and covered with um, brightly colored hairs throughout its whole body. Um, but you're maybe more likely to see them in late summer where you can see the caterpillars, which are quite obvious because they're really large. They're maybe 10 centimeters long, really thick. And they have these really uh, obvious eye spots on them, just like this. So the head itself of the caterpillar is just down here, this tiny little head, but it has these eye spots which can deter predators from attacking it because they think it's a larger thing overall. Perhaps they might think that it's a snake or some kind of reptile which might harm it. So you will see them going across paths in late summer, um, looking for somewhere to spend the winter where they go into leaf litter. And um, they, this seems to be a species which is spreading northwards. So do look out for it, um, especially uh, July, August and September time. In your garden, so you might find them feeding upon fuchsias. So because fuchsias have a similar type of leaf and they flower around the same time of year. So fuchsias in gardens can also be a, a caterpillar food plant for the species. Now onto the thistles, which are both uh, caterpillar and nectar plants. So we'll start with marsh thistle, which as its name suggests, is likely to be found in wetter places. Um, overall, you've got very tall, straight stalks. So the stalks themselves are quite straight, poker straight. Um, they don't have many divisions going along the stems themselves. Overall, it's quite a dark plant. So the leaves are quite dark in appearance and they're covered in very fine prickles. But if you look at the flowers, um, they're all held mostly at the top of stems, but you find lots of flowers together. So you can see one flower here, which is open and it's a dark purple color with many little other flowers around the sides, just about to open up too. Now the spear thistle, um, this is one that's got thicker stems and they're slightly more divided, as you can see from the photograph here. The flowers themselves are all, um, they're large and bulbous, so they've got a much more round appearance overall, and they're much larger than those of the marsh thistle. You can see these really long spikes coming out from them too. Now the creeping thistle is probably our, our commonest thistle out of this group, um, and it's one which is considered a weed. And even though I say the word weed today, um, of course, I just mean a plant which uh, for some people is found in the wrong place. So um, thistles maybe aren't so uh, desired in people's gardens or in parks and places like that. So people do often pull them out. But the word weed um, is not a scientific phrase. It's just, a, it's just an opinion. Um, so uh, the flowers for this species though are much paler purple than the others. And you've got many flowers at the ends of stalks. And overall, you'll see that the leaves themselves are quite shiny. They're not covered in many hairs. Um, and that's another distinctive thing of the species. Now, all of these thistles though, um, they're all great nectar plants. So you get butterflies and moths and other insects visiting them to get food from them. But also they're the main caterpillar food plant for the painted ladies in Scotland. This is because whenever the painted ladies arrive here, this is when the thistles are coming into their best. So they're, they're full of energy, they're full of nutrients and the flowers are in bloom. So the painted ladies can lay their eggs upon them and hopefully their caterpillars will feed for a while and then will develop into adult butterflies, which should fly down south for the winter.
uh, onto a completely different group of plants. We're back to the Fabiaceae or the pea family. Um, th this is the only one to be featured today. Um, it's called Greater Bird's Foot Trefoil. Um, and this is similar to Bird's Foot Trefoil, which is mostly found in dry places, whereas Greater Bird's Foot Trefoil definitely prefers damper habitats. Um, so it grows taller than regular birds with trefoil and you'll see it scrambling up through grasses and rushes. So for me, if I see a, a yellow flower, which is scrambling up through really rushy, marshy habitat, I'll usually assume that it's going to be greater birds with trefoil. If you look at the seed pods as well, they're quite long and thin and there's many of them. So there's lots of seed pods here coming out from the developed flower. Um, they're quite long and thin like this, whereas in regular birds with trefoil, there tend to be fewer of them um, and they're shorter and stubbier. So this is one of the caterpillar food plants of the common blue butterfly. However, I, I think that regular birds with trefoil will be much more used by this in Scotland, just because the common blue really does prefer those warmer, drier spots, whereas um, your greater birds with trefoil is going to be in damper spots just by its nature. Then we're on to another good nectar plant, and this is called goldenrod. Um, goldenrod is often grown in gardens uh, where it can look really, really nice and flowers at the end of summer and can bring lots of colour. But we do have a native species of goldenrod here. You get them in two different habitats, which is quite interesting as well. So there's two different subspecies, one which is found in woodlands, heathland and in dunes, and another one found along uh, stream sides, cliff edges and on mountain sides. So one of the subspecies looks like this. You can see it's quite densely flowered, whereas the other one is much, uh, much thinner in appearance and it's much more rod-like. But as you can see, it's got these yellow flowers going up the whole stem. And the leaves themselves are lanceolate, which just means that they're lance-shaped, um, so they're quite long and thin. Um, and you might confuse it, first of all, probably with ragwort, but ragwort um, has much more divided leaves, kind of a curly appearance to the leaves and the, the flowers themselves are much more flat, so it never grows in a rod shape like this. So we've come to the end of the talk about flowers themselves. We want to talk about the habitats now, and our wet meadows um, are not in a great condition, so we actually already have lost the majority of our met, wet, wet meadows in Scotland. That's just been through, throughout time, there's been drainage of these places, um, and that's mostly been for agriculture. Um, others um, which remain are really heavily grazed, so they have no or a few wildflowers left in them, so they're not great habitats for insects anymore. But we are doing a lot of work with conservation agencies now and other partners and landowners and farmers to maintain these wet meadows by removing scrub, for example. So on some sites where um, the wet meadows remain, we might go in and take out birch or willow, and that's because these trees can really dry up those habitats and they'll turn them into wet woodland instead of wet meadows. So when we take out things like that, we also might encourage grazing. So we might um, put in new fencing to help with um, grazing regimes. It's really important that we do keep these places grazed because if you don't, they become really um, overgrown. You'll get trees coming in and then the meadow itself disappears. So probably the best grazing would be throughout the winter, taking the stock off in the summer and then putting it back on the following winter to maintain these open habitats. Um, but you can also make them in urban places <clears throat> and through the Helping Hands for Butterflies project we've actually been working on a wet meadow in Glasgow. This is in Springburn Park where there's a really wet area where the grass cutters don't like going into anyway because they find it quite difficult. So we're working with the council and they've given us this piece of land to work on and with volunteers we've been going in, we've been wrecking out um, some of the old vegetation, planting new flowers, um, especially through plug plants and through seeds. And in its first year after this area had stopped being mown, um, it looked like this. So it was full of ragged robin, um, different types of buttercups, their little different forget-me-nots, rushes and reeds, um, and orchids as well. So these orchids have been there for years, but were getting cut two or three times a year. So probably hadn't bloomed in, in quite a while. So after one year of letting the grass grow longer, these orchids appeared back. And that includes the common spotted orchid and the northern marsh orchid. And if you look at our riverbanks, um, most of our, the studies on riverbanks or rivers themselves focus on the water quality that includes the pollutants within them. Riverbanks in general um, are in relatively good condition because you can't farm too closely to the riverbank and they shouldn't be built upon. So many of them are still intact. 
However, they're threatened by things like fertilizer coming from crops, which favors the growth of really tall plants, but some of those lower growing plants then will be sheltered out by those. A major threat to them is an invasive non-native plant species, such as Himalayan balsam and giant hogweed. We'll have a look at some of those now. So Himalayan balsam is a really beautiful plant um, and it's loved by bees, especially bumblebees and honeybees. Um, so it's a great nectar and pollen source for them at the end of summer. However, it's a non-native species which is just getting out of control. Um, as, as you can see from the photo, it really um, can cover whole riverbanks where it shelters out all the native vegetation um, and it doesn't give them a chance to flower. It can also damage the riverbanks as well, so it's causing erosion wherever it grows. You can control it by things called balsam bashing, where you go along and you pull out the plants before the seeds explode. Um, because the seeds of this plant, um, the seed pods explode when you touch them, so it can spread very quickly into new habitats. So it's best to get them before the flowers come onto the plants. Then with giant hogweed, it truly is giant. Now there's a native plant called hogweed, which only grows to about, uh, about head height at most. Whereas giant hogweed, as you can see, grows about the height of two people. It's a very, very tall plant. Um, and it's got these um, really uh, large blooms at the end of the stalks with very large leaves. So again, it's sheltering out native plants, but it's also an extreme irritant to skin. So if you do find this plant, do not touch it because it will cause blistering and scarring on your skin. Um, and it's one that really needs control by specialist agencies. And you can get involved. So there's some local conservation projects now which organize uh, groups to go out and to monitor these plants, but also to take control of them. If you're in the north of Scotland, there's the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, which is great to get involved in. And you can tell them where you're finding some of these plants or get involved in the control of them. In Edinburgh, then you've got the Water of Leith Conservation Trust doing this work too. And then there's the Fourth Rivers Trust as well, doing some of this work to bring, bring our rivers back into good condition. And if you volunteer with any of these groups, um, you'll also be helping butterflies and other insects. So it's definitely worth doing a bit of research to find out what's in your area and getting involved with them. So that's us finished for today. Um, thanks for listening. And now I'm happy to take some questions and answers.